this week on the Back Table Podcast. Yeah, for me, it's uh, the most part is you have to stay very focused on your whole procedure from the axis with the um, ultrasound uh, and then also put your um, stents through the sheets uh, up to the point of interest because they also can move on that or, or lost on, the, on your way to the point of interest. And then you have to check where you're always intimal and sometimes it's not. And sometimes you need another angle with your uh, sea arms. It's also a good opportunity to check where you are. And personally, I have also some, some difficulties that we have our wire behind the aortic stand and then you are look at twice and say, oh, that is not what you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things endovascular and more. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on any platform like Spotify or our website, backtable.com. You can also follow us on socials like Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and keep up with the latest updates. Please give us feedback through comments. We love hearing from you. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See RadPad.com for more information and contact info at RadPad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on episode pages at backtable.com, or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. Now, on with the episode. I'm Sabine Dond, an IR in LA, and I'd love to welcome Dr. Martin Schroeder, a vascular surgeon from all the way at University of Bochum in Hern, Germany. Welcome, Martin. And I'm sorry for butchering the German language right there. <laughs> so thank you, Theron. It's nice to meet you, and you guys are very great a job here at the back table. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Of course, Martin. I mean, I have to give you a shout out to you and your platform, Vascopedia. I mean, I love the name. I love the content. I've learned a ton from all your vast educational content, even on our topic today, Sarab. I mean, you guys have done such an outstanding job on that platform. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Vascopedia is a great project and we love that, really. We are really into it. Well, you guys are doing a great job. And before we go into our topic, let our listeners know a little bit more about you and, and your practice out in Germany. Well, I'm a vascular surgeon and I'm on the University of Bochum, like you mentioned. And we do, uh, like you said, vascular and endovascular approaches. Um, yeah, from, from the top to the bottom and below the knee and all the stuff like we, we can do. And yeah, we have also the, the Cerap technique and PhD and everything like we have uh, surgery from an endovascular surgery of that. How big is your practice? Are you all vascular surgeons in your practice? Are you hospital based? Yeah, all, all on the, the hospital there. And we are a team of uh, four vascular surgeons and we have a hybrid OR and we have two ORs with a normal OR and a hybrid OR and we can use it every time. So it's very easy and comfortable for us. Well, let's get into it. I mean, first of all, how do you pronounce it? Is it CRAB, CRAB, CRAB? What is the preferred pronunciation and what the hell does it mean? Uh, well, it's not crap, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't spell like the CRAB technique. So covered endovascular aortic bifurcation reconstruction, yeah. So covered, I mean, C is the big word there, covered. Why don't we think about bear over here? What's the advantage of covered over bear? Well, this is a good question. And uh, the, the history shows that uh, the normal stance we use in the beginning was in the bifurcation. Uh, we, we start with the normal stance. And the Palma stand was the first one. And we see, or we saw that uh, in some cases, we saw in the COBIS trial that the TLR or the, the occlusion rate is very high in a combination or in between to the 
difference to the covered stance. So this is the beginning of to use covered stance for this procedure. Perfect. So we've seen the data, COVID and all that the covered stance, especially in the iliacs and, and the aorta are the way to go. Now for the Sarab technique, what are your ideal lesions? Are they aortoiliac total occlusive lesions, you know, bilateral iliac, distal aorta occlusion? Is it something stenotic, one side open? What's the ideal lesions you would treat? Well, you can use with the Sarab technique, the easiest way, I would say it's a little bit going through so you can go uh, very easy past the lesion and you don't need to go with your wire sub but it's the best way or where we look for it to treat is task C and task D lesions. So it's very specialized, yeah. Okay, so we touched on, we're going to touch a little bit more on sub and doing these, you know, obviously versus the true lumen, but we're, we're going to be talking about aortoiliac severe disease, test C, D, whether there's severe stenosis or occlusions there. What's your preoperative imaging of choice? Do you prefer CTA only for this? Would you work off an MRA? Those being the two primary for evaluating these lesions. Yeah, well, when we think about the, the measurements and what is really important for us is that we need a, a good CT angiography. So this is very important. Maybe with a uh, one millimeter slice, so everything is very good to see. And in my opinion, is the CT the better one in uh, comparison to the MRI? Because you see the thrombus, you see the calcification, you see more details instead of the MRI. And this is very important for us in planning the setup. We need to measure the intraluminal area and not the outer area. And so they're a little bit more better to see in a CTA instead of the MRI. That's very true. The MRI or MRA will have calcium blooming. You won't really see all the cal. You'll see the lumen of the aorta and vessels to a degree, but it's not going to be as accurate as their CTA. So that's a very good tip for the listeners that for sizing and planning, a CTA is really, really needed in aeroiliac occlusive disease. So what I thought would be really good is to talk about each step of doing a Sarab and I'll basically stop you at each step and, and talk about each one. So let's just start with access. Are you doing bilateral groin access for all of these? Well, one thing to the CTA, of course, you always see the CT. If you there is a stand for beginning, so in the MRI, you don't see anything when there is an stand inside, but in the CT, you can see, okay, there is a stand, maybe for a pre-op observation for that or something else in, in the future or for the past. And then you can say, okay, there is, there's a stand with a CT, you better can measure that, all those things. So that was another way. And for the treatment, when we go there right now is very important is the access. So first, and then we go for the access, um, we always puncture with the ultrasound needle. So because access is like the most important thing. So for us as a vascular surgeon, it's easy. We can cut open the ground. We can see the vessel, but the access is ultrasound puncture, very important. So we do with the pre-close system with the ProGlide, but the other things is also star close or the uh, Manta systems and always good closure devices. So it's up to you what you need or what you think. But in my opinion, we need a good access. And you see with the ultrasound where you go your needle and where's the plug maybe. And in my opinion, it's the best way. You have to see where, where your needle is. So where you go through the foot through the wall from the arterial. Yeah. I mean, it is by far none ultrasound guided groin access should be done. How often these type of cases, are you actually doing open cut downs? How often are, are the common femorals that bad where you need to do that? Yeah, we, we have to do that when uh, the bifurcation in the femoral, in the common femoral artery is occluded or we have a, a high process of arteriosclerotic and we do a thrombectomy in that way or we have to patch it with a normal pack or something else and we, we cut it open. And it's also a good practice in a lot of clinicals, they do that in that way. So it's not that normal that uh, in, in the percutaneous way to do it. And it's very important to note that 
although we're fixing the inflow, the outflow has to be good. And so if you do all this and either you plug up the common femoral because it's so diseased and you're closing it or, or the common femoral is just bad itself, you're really going to do a disservice for all this aerto-iliac recanalization. So outflow is key. And so it's great that as a vascular surgeon, you have that option to do, you know, an endarterectomy if that needs to be done. Yeah. And in another way, we have to think about, we need a big sheet. And so it's more important that we have good access for that. So we talk about nine French. You know, we have to exactly for the larger size stent that's going in the aorta, that's going to require a bigger sheet. So pre-close technique works really well. If you are doing a percutaneous, I'm assuming you're mainly doing pre-close technique for closure. I haven't personally used the Mentis myself. You like that device? Does it work well or do you like suture mediated more? Yeah, it's like the angular seal. You have a, like an anchor inside the EDR, uh, the, the uh, vessel, and it's very comfortable. Yeah, from that one. Okay, so after the access, now we won't go into the details of crossing these lesions. Really, not yet. We'll touch on that later. But you get access on both sides with wires into the aorta. Correct. So let's start from that step now. What's the next step? What do you do once you have both your wires, you got good three, five wires into the aorta? What's the next thing to do? Yeah, we need a good hard or stiff wire, maybe a Lundacrist or Amplitzer or something else. So we need a good stiff wire. And then we go through the aorta and we check it if we are inside the aorta. That's got to be done. And <laughs> we do not want to stand intima. <laughs> So we have an easy case right now. Okay. Then in the, my department, we can measure inside the ORR. We make an angiography and then we can measure inside the ORR. And then we check the, again where we are. And uh, then we choose the aortic stand. And then we have to look at the uh, French size, maybe a 12 French seat or something else. Then we put the aortic stand up to 50 millimeter from the bifurcation because we want to create a new bifurcation. So we go a little bit further through the bifurcation in the aorta wall. And then we have to look where's the mesenteric uh, inferior artery. And we have to choose if we protect them or have to, we can uh, cover them. So we have to also see first in this first steps, uh, is, is everything right with the SMA or did we have here a problem or we have to choose maybe a scaffold or a chimney or something else for the MI? So a little couple questions about this step. Now, you already mentioned you measure from the inner wall. You have a measurement from your CTA. How often does that measurement not coincide with the measurement you do angiographically and then you measure on fluoro? Are they usually the same? Is it usually undersized, oversized? What do you find in your practice? Well, it's nearly the same, but sometimes we have some patients also in Corona times that we see them after uh, six weeks or more, then um, they could be a little bit different. And uh, we have also maybe CNCT, there was the limb open and after that time there is an occlusion. So yeah. we have a completely different treatment for that. Disease progression happens from, you know, the time you've had your planning. So. Now, what you mentioned, the IMA, that's generally considered, you know, you would like to stand below the IMA if you can, uh, you know, but obviously if the disease went above the IMA and the SMA and celiac are open, then you could obviously cover it. But what are your typical size stents that you're using in this aorta from a lot of lectures I've seen and, and stuff I've done on my own, you know, a 12 millimeter stent works usually in this size, even though the aorta is a little bit bigger on top, but mostly the disease, at least 15 millimeters above the bifurcation is usually less than 12. Is that true? Well, 12 millimeter fits very well. And the second step is that we can flare the, the proximal part from uh, the stent. So we have to choose because mostly the bifurcation or the aortic distal part is tapered. And this is the important thing for the therap technique. So we have to flare the proximal part of these aortic stands. And in the distal part, we put then after that, the limb stands there. 
How much do you flare it by? Do you just go by about two millimeters, two, three, or how much do you flare the proximal end by? Yeah, up to four or three millimeters. It depends on the aortic. You use B graphs, I think you said. How much can they be oversized by from their original deployment? Okay, it's a tough question, but uh, there's a chart on that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> they do. Okay. I don't think we have B. I, I might be wrong. But the graphs that we have in the USA, balloon expandable stent graphs, at least, we have VBX, we have Livestream, and we have Atrium. I may be missing one or two. I believe B-Graft is in Europe and not here. I know most of these that we have can be oversized by two millimeters, minus the VBX, which if they have the L designation, they can go from an eight to a, they can go all the way to 16 without ripping the fabric. Do you notice when you flare the proximal end, are these graphs you're using, are they developing foreshortening at all? Do they, they probably foreshorten by a millimeter or something or no? Yeah, you have to mention to that, but the VBX, you can flare only to 60 millimeters. And this is not really much that we know from the order. It's more than maybe 20 or 24. So when you go up to the renal arteries, it could be necessary that we need a, a larger diameter for that one to cover. So in my opinion, we need a good covered stand with a large diameter. So the VBX is a good one and the Advanto also, but also you have to mention uh, the, yeah, the shortening when you flare. Well, when you go from proximal, it's only one or two millimeters. So it's not that much. So the flaring is so that you can oppose the graft onto the aorta essentially create a seal, right? You don't want a type 1 endo leak on this final product. So the flare basically creates the seal so that the blood now is contained into this initial stent. Once that is deployed, the big question people get a little worried about is what do you do on the contralateral side? You're essentially, quote unquote, losing the wire, right? You're pulling it back. Can you lose access into the system? Yeah, you could. But you have two ways to do it. You can put the wire after placing the stand, and then you go in the next step with your wire through like an EVAR to go to the contralateral limb. And you have to also check your intimal yeah, when you place the stand. So it's very, very necessary for that one to check where you are, that you are intraluminal in the, the aortic stand. So this is very important. And do you check while you spin a pigtail, kind of like what we do during EVARs? One tip I learned was to deploy the initial aortic st Say you have an occluded iliac side and an open iliac side. You would actually deploy the aortic stent on the occluded side because that's the quote unquote harder one to recanalize. And then because the other side is open, you can retract the wire and go through the lumen because it was already open. Is that something you kind of do? Any other kind of tips like that you would recommend? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. It's the better way to go with the odd extent through the occluded uh, limb. And uh, it's easier to go than from the other side to, to recanalize to that way. Yeah. But recanalization is an, an, the next step. Maybe we can uh, go into that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that. Now you have deployed the aortic stent. The one that you have the wire on is obviously intraluminal. You've confirmed intraluminal on the other side. How do you size the iliac stent grafts? The second step. This is, this is the, you know, quote unquote, final step of the CRAB. Now, how do you determine that size and length? Yeah, well, normally we use uh, eight millimeters. And so 12, 80 is, is, is a normal thing. But also uh, with the pre-op CT scan, you can see, is there a different, have we any calcification on that? Is the iliac or the hypergastric artery, is, is there occluded or have we had something to see to fix in our operation to that? So yeah, you can always look at the other side. Is there, well, a healthy side or we have an, an extra aterosclerotic things to see. So these are second ways to see is there a healthy side we, we can look at it so is there the healthy side maybe eight millimeters so we can choose also of the other side eight millimeters why not so this is my way and we measure them also now is it a problem say you used a 12 millimeter stent for the aorta 
And like you mentioned previously, you go about one and a half centimeters above the bifurcation. That That's to basically for the shoulder of the balloon, right? When the shoulder of the balloon deployment so that it doesn't rupture your iliac, basically, uh, and gives you enough room. So it's about 15 millimeters above the bifurcation. Now, say the distal stent has only been expanded by 12 millimeters and you put two eight millimeter stent grafts and, and you deploy those. Now, isn't that some people will, will will be worried that that's 16 millimeters, you know, eight plus eight is 16 on an axial dimension. So is that a problem that now you've kind of created a 16 millimeter diameter at that bifurcation, kind of like an Erlenmeyer flask, you know, like, is that any issues? Have you run into any problems with that? First, I want to go through your first question when we go 50 millimeters above the bifurcation. So we need that space for, it's like a cylinder or the balloon is like a cigar on the ends. So they can go through the limbs and can maybe dissection or something else. So it's very necessary to have the space for that. And the second step is uh, if there are any problem, you can put your balloon and your stand is on the vessel wall. And you can go a little bit with your sheet through and push the, a little bit more open or up. Then you place the stand and then you deflate. And then you go a little bit higher. So we have not only the whole uh, diameter for the stand is recommended. And then we go a little bit higher. And because we have the vessel wall and the, the stand is placed. And after that, we go a little bit higher. And then uh, we have also this tapered area. And we need this tapered area and also this 50 millimeter space to recanalize the other one of the limbs. And then the other side is we need this for create a new limb or the new bifurcation and uh, also the ceiling zone, which is very necessary for that. Yeah, okay. And you always, obviously when you're deflating these balloons, you're always advancing the sheath over the balloon, kind of protecting the sheath so it doesn't get caught on the stent, correct? Is that something you pretty much always do? It's like this push and pull. So when we deflate the balloon, then we go through with the sheets and it's mostly on the beginning of these stands where you can um, push your struts or something else, which, which can struggle in there. That would be bad. <laughs> Happens that you can fix it. And then also, can you address that question about the diameter? If that's something that I, I sometimes come into my head where if you put two eight balloons and then that diameter is going to be 16, have you ever cracked an aorta or something on a heavily calcified bifurcation? Anything like that ever happen? For me right now, no, but it could happen. Well, so we are here with covered stands. So I need, there is, we have to care about it, but uh, we don't have to fear about it for me. I uh, forgot to ask actually in the beginning, are you performing these under sedation or GA? You can do both, but uh, in, in our hospital, we do it with a sedation. Yeah. The sedation. Okay. It depends on the on the patient. If it's really, really uh, sick or do you have another uh, thing? So you have to look at your patient. Is there something else with a heart disease or something else? So, so. Okay, so we've deployed both of the limbs. So now you've created that new bifurcation. With that bifurcation, it is raised by 15 millimeters. Are you able to use that bifurcation to go up and over anymore? Or have you lost the ability to go up and over if you're doing treatment peripherally down the leg. You mean you, you have your place stand and then you want? Yeah, I would say with this raised bifurcation, a lot of times when we do kissing, this is kind of like kissing stance, you lose that ability to go up and over, but with just traditional wires and catheters. Can you still do that in this one or not really? Yeah, you can, of course, you, you can go through, so why not? Okay, perfect. And. How often do you have to extend the stents after you, you use, you're pretty much using the longest iliac limbs you have, which are, how did you, how long are they usually? About six centimeters? Yeah, six centimeters normally the way, because you have go the limb legs into the aortic stand also for 50 millimeters. So it, it, there is the 15-15 rule. The 15-15 rule. And how often are, do you have to extend the stent past the hypogastric? Yeah, well, it depends on your occlusion or the test is easier. Yeah. So we do it, we call it like full metal jacket, <laughs> but it happens, of course. Yeah. And then we, when we look, if it's really hard occlusion or really hard plaque there, then we use also a um, covered stand and not so uh, there is uh, for recommended for the um, iliac external 
self-expandable stand for that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's talk about some difficult situations here. All right, we'll talk about crossing techniques here. So you have a nasty heterodiliac occlusion, all right? Both sides are occluded. You have tried, but you have to go sub into mole. And uh, one, you enter as low as possible, but you enter low in the aorta. Are you using any reentry devices here? And if you do go sub into mole, can you still do this technique? So first of all, we, we try to go from both sides to cross over technique or to snare some wires, or we go from the arm. So when we have that one, well, it's not my favorite uh, part to go from the arm because um, we lose a little bit of stiffness or something else. Also, we have uh, the problem with the um, stroke from that way. We see in some ways that when we have a more stroke to that. So if we have all these things go, or we have to, to um, our opportunities is, is uh, where we, with the, with the CDO trade or with, with the CDO uh, wires, we can choose that one. And well, if nothing happened, it's a possibility to go with a needle system or something, how it's called, the Outback, or there are a lot of things. We have some opportunities in our hospital. There's also the go-back system. And we also use the Ivo system in combination with the needle system. It's the pioneer system from, from Philips. So it's very easy to see where is um, my lumen and where is the, um, yeah, the sub intimal way. And so we can go with these systems um, into the, the right lumen and the order. And then we look, we, we need a very distal part. So it's have to, the, the entry, the re-entry must be in the near of the uh, bifurcation because it's too much up there, the aortic, then we create a new way and it's not the best one for that. So that's important for our listeners. And when we do this, uh, we've all been there when we've done these iliac re occlusions. Sometimes it's very hard to get low. I mean, if you have so much of an occluded distal infrarenal segment, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be impossible. But this technique should be used when you have either a luminal crossing or a subintimal with a low reentry, preferably right at the proximal common iliacs. But subintimal doesn't, you would still do this type of technique for a subintimal recanalization. That, that's an important fact. What are some situations that you would not, other than a high reentry or, or high entry, what are some other situations that you would not do this technique in the settings of aeroiliac disease? First of all, we, we can use also this crack technique that we uh, use a normal balloon to bring it uh, up to the bifurcation and to create a, maybe a new a way for that. And sometimes it fits and it's helped us to get a re-entry. And also um, we have the opportunity to co-puncture this balloon with the needle system. So it's easier to, like a darting game, <laughs> you can puncture the, the balloon very easy with the needle system and uh, you see, okay, this is my goal and we have to go to that way. Yeah, and it's very um, protective. So I use it once or twice in, in the cases. So it's very handsome for that one when you only use the needle system without the IVOS. Yeah, that is uh, a good point for that. What's the highest you've gone up to to treat? Have you gone up to the renals? No, no way, not. <laughs> for that way. Uh, it's too high. So, so we need uh, to go uh, only. So there are some cases to cover the uh, whole uh, order. So um, sometimes we need two uh, audit stands and there are some cases with uh, chimney technique for that way. So when you have a Lerich system or a Lerich syndrome, then uh, sometimes you have to use this uh, like in combination with the chimney technique, but it's very difficult. So. Um, yeah, that's a, those are long cases. Those are your chimney and, and bilateral arm. Just, just a lot of stuff going on there. But one kind of comment on this technique that some people have, at least in the U.S., is cost. Now, these, these aortic stent grafts are pretty pricey, but any kind of recommend, I mean, the, these cases are basically coded as, as aortic stent grafts. Is that how you guys... Do that over there too, or is there any limitation to cost over there? Over here, we just, just the stent grafts are pretty pricey, but it's a big procedure either way. Yeah, but you need 
a good stand, in my opinion. When you don't have a good stand, the, the whole procedure doesn't work. So it's like driving a good car. You have a good outcome for that one. And we need in that cases, mostly in test C and D lesions, good covered stand, which is um, with, a, with a high radial force for that. And we need a good stand in the aortic, which is in the proximal part for the um, stretch that in, in this area. So these both things are very necessary for that. And well, these devices are really expensive for us. So um, it's, yeah, well, we, we don't, yeah, we, we don't can discuss that way. <laughs> It's expensive to do an open, you know, aero by fem. So it's the same thing. What about your medical management following these cases? You're all done. You close the groin. It went fine. Are you doing dual antiplatelet therapy? Are you doing anything like that or, or not needed? Well, we do a dual uh, antiplatelet uh, therapy with uh, clopidogrel and aspirin for three months. And then that's all. And uh, aspirin for, for the whole time. Any anticoagulation ever, any kind of like direct oral anticoagulant or, or none of that? No, none of that. So sometimes in yeah, where we, uh, there is in some cases, if we have a low outflow or they occluded of the lower limbs or something else, then we can choose a little bit more anticoagulation yeah. like um, the NOAC or something else. But it depends also which is the outflow from that one. And finally, what's like a big learning point, maybe some one learning point from this technique, maybe of some complication that you've had or something that you're like, okay, I wish, I wish I knew this, that you could tell some of our listeners. I know it's a kind of a loaded question, but something you're like, oh man, if, if I had known this, this would have been easier. Yeah. For me, it's uh, the most part is you have to stay very focused on your whole procedure from the axis with the um, ultrasound uh, and then also put your um, stents through the sheets uh, up to the point of interest because they also can move on that or, or lost on, the, on your way to the point of interest. And then you have to check where you're always intimal and sometimes it's not. And sometimes you need another angle with your uh, C arms. It's also a good opportunity to check where you are. And personally, I also some some difficulties that we have our wire behind the aortic stand and then you uh, look at twice and say oh that is not what you want yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think things that you said you know i'll just kind of reiterate them one is always advance your sheet and uncover the stent don't push the stent through diseased vessel i have done that before on a balloon mounted system because I was trying to skip a step and of course my stent fell off, right? And it's just stupid to do that. It's late, it just, just advance your sheet and uncover the stent and you can always pull back a little bit if you need to, but, but that's a very important step. The other one is don't be complacent, don't rush, be calm, check your wire. You know, yeah, it may look, you may be working with a stiff glide and, and you, you take, retract the wire and you push it and you're like, I'm through, but actually you're just by the side of the stent and you have no idea. And if you don't check, uh, fine, nine times out of 10, you're probably right. But that one time out of 10, you're not, you are in big trouble. So uh, like you said, check your wire, do all that, keep calm. I think those are super important. I mean, Vascopedia, you guys have awesome videos on this technique. I have watched them myself before doing this and they're really great. And, and I do think this, this technique partly is, is very visual. So if some of you are confused after seeing this and want to see how that works, just, just log on to vascopedia.com, search Sarab, and you're going to find, you know, even Martin has a great video on there and it's really great. All these tips. I mean, really, man, thanks so much for coming on. I really think that this is a great way to treat aeroiliac occlusive disease and it was really nice talking to you thank you very much Sirin. thank you so much for listening if you haven't already make sure to subscribe rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend if you have any questions or comments direct message us at at underscore back table on instagram twitter or linkedin Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, 
Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.